What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Pio Pitch Video Podcast at Marietta College. Uh, my name is Tucker Nelson. I'm a freshman at Marietta College. I'm double majoring in sports management and marketing. Uh, our guest today is Scott Nelson. He's the owner uh, and founder of Local Team Shop and Safe Face. He started Local Team Shop about 10 years ago uh, and has only grown since. Uh, his goal is to service football coaches all over the country with their needs for cloth and customs, uh, whether it be for coaches, players, fans. All over the past 10 years, uh, Mr. Nelson expanded his business uh, by by sponsoring, uh, participating in big events, you know, all over the world. Uh, and then when the pandemic hit, businesses slowed down. And unlike many entrepreneurs who struggled during that time, he pivoted his whole business plan and started his second company, Safe Face. So in only two months, Safe Face produced um, and distributed 65,000 masks from coast to coast. Quite a bit of experience from an entrepreneurship standpoint, uh, knows a lot. I'm glad to have you here today with me. I'm looking forward to uh, getting some more information and, uh, and learning a little bit more about you. So first, you know, with obviously your company that you've started, you know, like I said, 10 years ago, tell me a little bit about Local Team Shop, what you do and what your goal is and what your plan was when you started this. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be with Marietta College. Great first question. The, I guess our elevator pitch for Local Team Shop is that, uh, you know, we're a marketplace for all coaches, you know, primarily, obviously, football is a lion's share of what we do, but we're active in all three seasons. But uh, being that we're a marketplace, a location where coaches, primarily high school coaches, coaches, you know, we believe in local markets. So the problem is that out there across the country is there's not a place in plethora where local coaches, high school and college coaches can go and get high level services for the programs that they have to service. We fix that problem by having a showroom. We're not retail. They're private showrooms, if you will, where coaches can come in here as the CEO of their company and get high touch and feel, product samples specialized knowledge, a whole array of uh, services that we provide for them. It's definitely one, a kind of a one of a kind business is, you know, the way I, I look at it at least. And so, you know, with this business, you know, that you started, you know, over 10 years ago, obviously that's, that's a long time. So, you know, whenever you were deciding to start this business and you had this plan that really not too many people have, you know, come out with. So something that, you know, is obviously a risk. So what was your motivation uh, whenever you, you know, wanted to go with local team shop and make it your own, you know, and move with this? What was, you know, I guess your biggest motivation that, you know, helped you, you know, drive this thing? Well, where we are today is not where we started, like a lot of companies. And I think when you talk about entrepreneurship, uh, what I have found now that I'm in this arena is that there are basically two type of entrepreneurs. Uh, one, an opportunity entrepreneur, and two, a necessity. I sure was the latter. I mean, I needed a job in the situation. Um, the whole idea is, you know, you can graduate from a necessity entrepreneur to an opportunity entrepreneur. But basically, when I look at entrepreneurship, you know, your opportunity entrepreneur is a guy that, you know, maybe you go to school, you study that, you look at markets that you think you can strive in, where there's a problem to be fixed, where there's great opportunity, big markets, and then you might, you know, gravitate to that. Uh, necessary entrepreneurs are people that, you know, listen, they might need a job. I had to have a job. I had to go to work. And this is just where I ended up uh, in this industry. And uh, we strive to make our business valuable every day. So obviously, you know, having that motivation to start your company, obviously what comes with that is challenges. And so, you know, getting your business started, you know, getting it going, try to, you know, get up that hill, I guess, to try to, you know, get it rolling. Like I said, it comes with challenges. So what was a, a big challenge for you when trying to just start local team shop and try to, you know, maybe get a customer here and there, do this deal, blah, blah, blah. What was your biggest challenge you think that you had? Maybe how did you deal with it? Obviously the biggest challenge for any company for us, you know, I was with a previous sporting goods company. It and I ended up leaving that company and starting Local Team Shop. When we started Local Team Shop, the biggest challenge you have, like a lot of companies you have, is entry, getting into the industry. Coming from a company that already had a position in there, and I was there for a specific reason, a different account. When that account no longer was available, there was no need for us to be together. So we decided, or I decided to go alone and start Local Team Shop. Entry is by far the hardest thing into any new company. And being a sales guy, you would think my first thought was, would be customers. We've got to get customers. That's going to be a big problem. You know, we didn't have an existing customer base to pull from. We had some that I'd call it on. So my focus was mainly on customers. I was customer driven on the new challenges. Certainly a lot more came with that when you, now that you're running your own company, there's things like capital, money, cash. You got to have cash, getting opened up with suppliers, getting, you know, banking, all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of roadblocks, you know, obstacles to overcome just getting entry into the industry. You know, with that, 
know, after being in the industry for longer than 10 years, obviously, like you said, you're with a previous company, but having your own business for 10 years, growing it, uh, like I said, you know, in your, your introduction, you've sponsored some events, things like that. You know, just by looking at your website and your social, I know that you've sponsored, you know, one of the biggest volleyball tournaments, you know, in the country right now in Washington, D.C., the Capitol Hill tournament, you know, doing things with the Ohio High School Athletic Association. You do a lot of different sponsorships for high school coaches, you know, that do things like that. Obviously, you've been a lot more involved lately and, you know, making different connections and things like that. So uh, I guess my question is, within those 10 years, what would you say has been the biggest change you have had in your company and, you know, how or maybe when it was or it could be over a year? What has been your biggest <coughs> change within your company? Yeah, that's a great question because for us, it came early. I mean, like when I say early, like maybe two years, we decided to enter this industry, you know, coming from previous company that we were mainly in retail and we decided and we had a retail presence, which we were in retail serving customers coming in. And when I exited that company and decided to start my own company, local team shop, and we wanted to focus on the coach, you know, it didn't take us long or me long to get up to speed that the coach was the economic influencer in this model that we wanted to do. We were just like everybody else. When we first started, we were road guys. We would go on the road and try to do business on the road and try to strum up business that way. Quickly, we found out that we were just another in the fragmented space of the purchasing decision of the coach. It wasn't going to work. So we had to figure out a different way to get in front of the primary customers. We thought, could we bring them to us? Two years into it, we thought, you know, if we don't change, if we don't become different, we're going to die in this old industry like everybody else. So we decided to open up own showroom. We thought, you know, would coaches come to us? Was there a big enough problem? Could we offer enough value and solve enough problems for them that they would travel to see us? So we started down that path. That's when local team shop essentially probably I'd say six years ago was really born. We started focusing on bringing coaches to us and operating on our turf. Everybody right. likes to play at home, right? right? So everybody wants to be home field. There is such thing as home field advantage and there definitely is that in business. Uh, we knew engagement matters. That's where it happens. And so in about six years we've been doing that we've been building out our own shops here for coaches to come in it's impressive that you're able to you know recognize that early and you know try to change your own much like your business model to get your customers and things like that so obviously you know 10 years you know goes by with this you have your company you've made changes you've, you've figured it out you know you're very successful always so now uh, obviously you're not the only company out there that sells apparel what sets local team shop apart from their competition uh, what values do you provide that sets you apart like i said from your competition one thing that would differentiate us from our competitors is that our relationship Relationships with our customers. We call them proprietary relationships. Our relationship with the customers are not just transactional. We're in contact with them all year round. Typically, if our coaches are not just operating their football programs or any of their programs just during the season. They have needs and problems to be solved all year round. Trying to get as close to them as possible, you know, and stay in touch with them a couple throughout the year. We have all kinds of services we can provide here. We ship them things throughout the year. Being able to operate here, they visit throughout the year, all that kind of stuff. We're involved like you said, in events all year round. We sponsor events. We just sponsored a big event this last weekend, uh, a football all-star game. Um, we're involved in trade associations. We have a really good way of staying engaged with our customer. Going a little bit away from local team shop now, you know, about two years ago, COVID, the pandemic, where a lot of entrepreneurs use that as kind of a crutch, a decrease in business or their business going under, which you saw a lot. You did not. You uh, pivoted your company and took a shot on another business. It worked out, you know, very well for you. But uh, I'm just curious to know what you went through as an entrepreneur. You know, obviously, local team shop, you know, when COVID hits, you pretty much shut down for good. Uh, there's really nowhere to make much money. But when you turn to safe face and, you know, started that up, you know, what'd you go through and what was your your mindset with that safe face you're talking about you know s-a-f-e f-a-c-e-d it's a story in of itself well i do get calls once a week from people wanting to interview us about that exercise or that business if you will i mean it's a lot of things uh, i guess first and foremost the very first thing that you always know, talk about that would be 100 survival there really wasn't a business model when that first came on there really wasn't any idea or concept of what we do we were like everybody else when the pandemic hit especially in this this space. I, I've read numerous articles where the sportswear industry is the hardest hit, one of the hardest hits in the, on the planet and still not recovered. So when we, like everybody else in there, we just had to figure out a way how we were going to survive. Safe face didn't come along for a while, although the timeline was extremely sped up. So it took us 10 years to get here. Things that we did in 10 years, we had to, with safe face, we probably did in like a month. 
I think when you put the timeline together, for me, the timeline of the pandemic, you know, March, Friday the 13th, 2020 always rings true to me because that was the day that I was sitting home and they decided to cancel the NCAA basketball tournament. So as you put a timeline together, March, Friday the 13th was like when I really knew as an owner of a company that we were into something that might be here for a while, right. that we had troubled waters ahead of us. So I still wasn't thinking about masks. I mean, who was thinking about masks that day, right? right? That day, day one, and we talked to people, if you go back and think about day one, it was very weird. I mean, mm -hmm. masks were like super weird, right? Nobody was, you wouldn't even know where to get a mask. You couldn't even get one. I mean, there was, it wasn't even comprehensible that you would go buy a mask. So we weren't thinking that way either. So when we came to work, like everybody else, when you really shouldn't be at work, when it was illegal to be at work, my partner and I were just sitting around a round table thinking about what we were going to do to survive. I remember the day that I was driving to work and a sheriff's deputy was following me. And I thought for sure he was going to pull me over because you weren't allowed to be out there on the roads. And uh, we weren't a central business yet, but you know, we had a warehouse where we still operate today where nobody comes in. So I had a garage I could park in. Nobody would see our car here. I happened to be at work that day. And one of our suppliers had called and said that they were going to enter the mass business. They were going to completely convert one of their plants and make it into a mass company. And this was early. You think about it, Mark, they were innovators. They were ahead of it. And they had just gone through an acquisition to buy a company, which is named Allison. Anybody listening here knows about sportswear companies. Allison is an old time company like Russell or Champion. They were, you know, frontiersmen in the supplementation of doing supplementation on products. So they called us because they knew that we had a unique model of going to the customer a new strategy of, of being in touch with the, the pure people to make the decisions. I mean, think about it. Say the whole world, the business world was idle, would be right. saying, would be good. It was down. Right. I mean, it was shut down, right? So that's what happened is that we got the first call because we had proprietary relationships with coaches and they thought that we could pull it off. They right. thought, listen, you guys could sell some masks. And even at that time, I wasn't sure about it. I mean, right. we weren't sure we can sell masks. What are you right. going to do? Sell masks? It's weird. And, right. and who was going to call a coach and tell them we were selling masks and yeah. we thought about it. And then, and then I guess that's when, uh, I mean, we still weren't even thinking about safe face to call right. something safe face. We we're just thinking about, you know, confiding the people that we trust, you know, marketing people or, or mentors of mine. And we're talking and we came to the realization if we don't do it, somebody might do it. Now we're thinking, okay, maybe if we have the option to be first in, maybe we should be first in. Do we call it local team shop or companies called local team shop? What do we do there? And then I'm not hundred percent sure myself or my partner, we, we need to call it something else other than local team shop. What's going to, the business side of us was like, what's going to make people buy? Moms are the buyers. Moms are the decision makers, especially in turbulent times. The mom's going to make the decision and we want it to be safe. We want to hook that mother with the word safe. You know, something's got to be safe, you know, take care of her family. And so uh, we looked at all kinds of web names, domain names. We wanted to call it safe face. It wasn't available. Something else. My tech partner calling at like two o'clock in the morning saying the only thing we could find was safe face, F-A-C-E-D. We're like, buy it, just buy it. And the whole idea was we're thinking that you would go out and get safe face. Remember the old like step into a Slim Jim commercial, step into a Slim Jim. So down the road, we may talk about it, but I mean, there's a whole case study being done now on this company safe face, because like you said, we did end up putting 65,000 masks in a circulation in like two months. We had a whole campaign. We thought we'd make our coaches the heroes, which is what we believe all along from local team shop, that we believe in our coaches as the local economic influencer. They're the ones we got to be tied to to move product. We believe that we're back to that now with our company now. But in this situation, we we made our coaches the heroes, that they were the ones that were going to protect their community. They were the ones that were going to protect their athletes. And they were the ones that were going to be able to, you know, win the day for the local communities. So not only did they buy them, we had a program where they distributed them. There's a whole thing about Safe Face, but we ended up filing with the Secretary of State for owning that name. Our supplier told us that we were the only guys that started a new business during the pandemic. And we we like 4 extra company on growth. That's super incredible. It's especially with the time you had and at a time where, where money was, you know, not just being thrown around by people that's sales wise, that, that's like I said, impressive. Obviously, you know, new company, safe face during a pandemic, but you're looking to sell and things like that, just like any other entrepreneur. You obviously sold to hundreds, thousands of different people, you know, were new to you, colleges, companies, things like that. But how important was it for you to have a relationship with your customers that you had built with local team shop and 
the, the, I guess you would say relationship that you had made with those coaches to where the respect level between you guys was tight. So when you did come to them with a safe face, the mask product and pitch them that, and they trusted you with that. And was your uh, minimum order, what, 400 or Mm-hmm. So, and I know that, you know, you've said before that, you know, a minimum order of 400 coaches would be like, I know you can talk about this, you know, they were hesitant about it. And you know, I, know, I want you to talk a little bit about how that went. But my question is, how important was it to build those relationships previously with local team shops? So then when something like this does say out of nowhere, you know, you kind of have that locked in for you and it works in your favor. That's impressive. You picked up on that, Tucker, because that's exactly what happened. It was because of proprietary relationships, the trust that we had built over a years with these customers. And here's what it did is Safe Face absolutely validated our model for local team shop because the pandemic completely leveled the playing field right now, overnight, big right. companies, small companies, it didn't matter. If you were agile and you can move like a speedboat, as opposed to a barge, you had the opportunity to move. And that's what our supplier knew that we were about. And when we say proprietary relationships, what makes them proprietary? It certainly wasn't money. We didn't have big contractual agreements with these companies coaches that they had to go to us. Some of them we didn't even have business with. But what we had is we had a lot of history and a lot of history comes with what you just said, trust. Right. They trusted us. So when I called one coach that was fishing with his kid and I told him, Chase, he's the head football coach. We're into these mass things. These are going to happen. You're going to have to have them. And we're getting out in front of them. You've been our program. You need to order them. Not a problem, Nelly. I'm with you. We're minimum orders 400. Not a problem. I'll do it. And I would tell him, you're going to sell all 400 and come back. Because I was seeing I was in the arena every day. I was the one selling. And when I'm talking to these people, we call them and say, we took on a lot of problems too with this thing here. Because remember, we sped up quickly. You know, we took on, you know, financing problems, all that kind of stuff. But in the selling cycle, when I would tell them, we created a flyer that you might've seen the flyer, the same flyer for every school, just changed the logo on it, had our information on it. They put that flyer on Facebook, got it out socially. They would call me back and they would say, I just put this thing out on on Facebook and I just sold 180 masks in 10 minutes. And like it's going crazy. I think you can still go to Twitter at SafeFace and look at all the threads and see that say, I just put it on Facebook, Scott, and I just got an order for 210 masks. That's how it was going. So I saw that coming in. So when some schools would say, I only want to do 100, it was nothing for us to say, we're going to send you 400 and we will buy back any you don't sell. They would mm-hmm. all do that. So that's how it was going. Then it just took off. We had a coach here, a high who had just came from West Virginia. So he called five coaches in West Virginia. Then they were, we're selling into West Virginia. And next thing you know, we're in Texas. We sold them in California. We were just selling them all over the world in the country. And so then what happened was is because we branded it, and I brought one here, because we put Safe Face on here, right. when, we, when we told the company that we would do it, that we would jump in the mask game. Right. We wanted to embellish all of our masks. And I'm not sure where this came about, how we thought of this, but we wanted to embellish all of them with safe face. We wanted to brand it so they'd be a safe face mask. It just took off because now we did videos and they would just call and they, we, we want a safe face mask. So we literally built a brand in a matter of weeks. And nice. it all went through all through our relationships with coaches and they told other coaches and next thing you know, we're doing it. And then it just went viral. Which is crazy enough. I think you know that which by the way it's a great mask right it's a great mask it was right. from the coaches that knew that they knew the allison name they knew the material was like polyester breathable all that kind of stuff i mean i know all the lingo i sound like a mask salesman now because i was for a year straight but this was still early imagine this i mean march 20th we said when the ncaa final four got canceled we had mask in circulation in 30 days and they it was two months later that under armor came out with their mask so it was two months before under armor and Rydell came out with their mask and we had already hit it and been out by having our meeting saying we better get in this if we don't somebody else will and then the way we went in and did it I mean um, not to mention we were nervous we had a lot of problems I mean we had 20,000 masks sold and I had not touched one yet so I was a little nervous you talk about all chips to the table all right. chips to the middle we're right. like we had 20,000 masks sold and I had not felt one yet, touched one yet, seen one yet. And I was nervous. And I told, I said, if these things don't show up as advertised, we'll be done. In turn, they showed up amazingly way more than as advertised. And it was just, there's a lot there. Yeah. 
a good team shot might be done as well. Honestly, the perfect answer I was looking for just to how important those relationships are and things like that, because you do never know in the future and things like that, you know, which you're a prime example for. Kind of back to just a, a business question in general, just more of a broad question uh, for, for you. What have you learned through either successes and failures? Just something that maybe someone told you, maybe you've learned through a failure, maybe a success, anything uh, that you've just kind of maybe stuck to or helped you grow or maybe allowed you to bounce back or something like that just over the years? I certainly have like five key things that I advice that I think I would give people if they were going to try entrepreneurship or try a company. But other than those four or five, I would say, you know, having conviction in what you're doing. I mean, right. you really have to have conviction. And sometimes you fight that back. Sometimes it's hard to know. And you think, is what we're doing really working? Or, you know, it's a fine line between knowing when to give it up, try something else, or they all, like they always say, don't ever give up, don't quit. But having conviction you know, to know exactly what you really feel that what you're doing is going to work. It's like they say, you know, tell me something true that nobody else believes. I mean, I was watching Moneyball came on last night and imagine that when Billy Bean for the Oakland A's tried that system. He had unequivocally conviction that that was going to work through analytics. Now analytics is everywhere. Every college teaches it, pro sports alone, but he was the first one in. He was right. the first one in that he felt by analytics it was going to work and it wasn't working to begin. Right. But he hung in there. And when you watch that movie, I watched that movie from that standpoint that that dude hung in there with absolute conviction that right. this thing was going to work when nobody else thought it would. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're there with this and really safe face kind of like helped validate our hypothesis. Honestly, something I just kind of want to wrap up with here, obviously, you kind of just touched on in the last question, but uh, I think there's probably some more you could give. But really, just what advice, you know, advice for growing entrepreneurs uh, like you were, you obviously were playing in their sandbox at one point or just starting entrepreneurs. What's, you know, any, you know, a piece of advice or maybe some some tools or something like that that you could give to them for their future? One thing. I know I can tell you is that there's like four or five things, but the first thing I'll, I'll say is that I'll share with you why they tell you that. Right. Meaning that every time you have a guest speaker, you know, a motivational speaker or a business person, they always tell you to do something you love, right? Say, so, yeah, if you do something you love, you'll never go to work. Yada, 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 yada. If you, if you always find something you like doing, then you'll never work a day in your life. The reason they tell you that, it's going to be a long, hard journey. The reason they tell you that is because for the days that fatigue sets in. The reason they tell you that is for when depression sets in. The reason they tell you that is when confusion sets in. It's a lot different going to work when you have to go to work when you don't like something or when you do like something. You know, right. if you like what you do and you have to go there, it's going to be easier to handle the times that whether you call it mental illness or confusion or depression or fatigue, it's going to kick in. It's going to happen. And it's a lot easier to make it through those tough times when you enjoy what you're doing or you like your customer base. I have those times, but I have a whole customer base that I really, really like. I mean, I have some customers I don't like, but right. the majority of them, you know, I feel like they need me. That's why they tell you that. The other ones would be take action. I struggle with this. As you have to take action. The easiest way to find out if something doesn't work is take an action. I mean, we've had some mishaps, but you have to take action. That's critical. If you don't know what to work, just take action. Just do it. So just do it. Make your dreams come true. Just do it. Just right. do whatever. Try it. For us, it's a new garment. It's a new design, different approach, whatever. We have a project right now because I overanalyze and I overprepare. That's one of my downfalls. You have to take action. And the other one would be get clarity. You have to fight for clarity because whether you're trying to convince somebody to be your customer, whether you're trying to convince a bank to give you financing, or whether you're trying to get a supplier to open you up, if you have clarity on what you're asking and what you're doing, the success rate is extremely higher. And then the last two, I would just lump together. They're big enough to be separate. We we live it every day and that's add value and solve problems. Basically, that's what entrepreneurship comes down to with our customers is that if you can add value, they'll find a place for you. If you can solve problems and that's what people want. They want you to add value and solve their problems. Those things I would do that I would take action, get clarity, add value and solve problems. You, know, you got a chance. No, that's really great information. That's cool to hear from you, especially, you know, speaking from existence and things like that. Great to hear 
a little bit about your story, your business plan, you know, your mindset throughout, you know, your whole company and things like that. And then when starting your new company in, in some different ways. So well, safe faced is no more. So we're back to local team shop now. Back safe faced is they don't even make the, the, the plant that they moved over there. They right. don't even make those masks anymore. We're doing a case study on that now. I'll stay in touch with you on how that's going to go. And I'm interested to hear about that. That'll be interesting. I appreciate, you know, you coming on to the uh, the Pio Pitch podcast. You know, it was Pleasure. a great having you on here. Uh, I appreciate your time, uh, most importantly. But uh, I really appreciate you coming on and, you know, sharing us, you know, a little bit about your business. Thank you again for coming on here and sharing us your time and, uh, and information. Yeah, have a Take good care. day. Yep. Yep.